We turn now from one champion of the public interest to another, from Sheila Baer fighting for greater oversight of the big banks to a global advocate for social justice named Vandana Shiva. We need a new paradigm for living on the earth because the old one is clearly not working. The last time we spoke with her, she was battling Coca-Cola and other multinational giants over the privatization of water in her native India, including the waters of the sacred river Ganges. Since then, Vandana Shiva has become a rock star in the worldwide battle over genetically modified seeds. Those are seeds aggressively marketed around the world by big companies like Monsanto to not only increase but also to monopolize food production and profits. Opponents challenge their safety, claim they harm the environment, are more costly, and leave local farmers deep in debt and dependent on suppliers. Following Europe's example, Many American consumers are demanding that food products made from genetically modified seeds be labeled. Monsanto, the world's largest supplier, claims intellectual property rights over its seeds and usually wins when it takes farmers to court for patent infringement. But in India, Monsanto claimed its seeds would produce bountiful crops, and when the results fell short, many bankrupted farmers reportedly killed themselves. Vandana Shiva founded India's Navdanya movement to promote the use of native seeds, and she's become a formidable figure in all these battles. Trained in physics, she's an activist and prolific author whose books include Earth Democracy, Soil Not Oil, Water Wars, and her latest, Making Peace with the Earth. I talked with her again recently when she came to New York to be honored by Union Theological Seminary. Welcome back. Wonderful to be back with you. It's an uphill battle you're waging. How do you keep doing it? What, what, what drives you, really? Um, you know, we have this very beautiful text in India, well, the Gita. Bhagavad Gita? The Bhagavad Gita. Yes. And there's a very simple lesson that Krishna gives, that you do not measure the fruit of your action. You have to measure your obligation for action. You have to find out what's the right thing to do. That is your duty. Whether you win or lose is not the issue. The obligation to do the right thing. For me, you know, I've grown up as an ecologist and a nature lover from my very childhood. And for me, the diversity of species, their intrinsic value, their integrity, is vital. The rights of our farmers to be able to have seed, the most fundamental source of a livelihood in a poor country. 80% of the food of the world is even today produced by those small farmers of the kind that we have in India. Our small farmers are feeding 1.2 billion Indians. We forget the scale of what smallness means multiplied many times because we've got used to the dinosaur mentality. We only see the big. We forget that dinosaurs go extinct. You have obviously seen things differently because you studied nuclear physics, right? I studied nuclear physics, but I also studied quantum theory. My thesis was on non-separability and non-locality in quantum theory. Which means? <laughs> Which basically means everything is connected. Because, you know, the, the industrial revolution and the scientific revolution uh, gave us a very mechanistic idea of the universe. First. We were told nature's dead. There's no living earth. How can you even imagine the earth lives? How can other species, they're just inferior creatures of God and you've got to have man's empire over God, uh, over the earth. The idea that everything is this hard matter unrelated to each other is still guiding a lot of science. Genetic engineering is based on that hard matter, genes in isolation, you know, genes determine everything. There's a master molecule that gives orders. Old patriarchal stuff. The real <laughs> science. Patriarchal? The real science is the science of interconnection. Whether it's of quantum of interconnectedness, of non-separation, that everything is related. Farming, for example, you must see the soil, the plants, the pollinators, the food that's produced, all of it in the whole. Let's take that into the system of economics because some people have said that Globalization, the movement of ideas, of people, of money uh, across 
arbitrary boundaries, boundaries as if they didn't exist also reflects the interconnectedness of everything. That globalization is an economic equivalent of what happens in the world of nature and that everything is connected and you can't stop it, Vanana Shiva. This is the way the world rocks. Well, first of all, uh, this is not interconnectedness at the ecological level. This is extremely artificial corporate rule on a planetary scale. Some corporations get to control the world. And then all that's flowing around is commodities. Commodities that don't have to be moving. It's still the old hard billiard ball model. Right. You know, you load the ships from China for cheap consumer products in Walmart here. That is not a world of interconnectedness. The world of interconnectedness would recognize that the rivers of China need to flow clean and free. It would recognize that um, the people of China need to exercise in work, in freedom, not as slave labor in factories to produce cheap goods. Um, this corporate globalization, based on more, a higher, a deeper reach of corporations in spheres where they had no role, food, water, the air, or into commodities, you know, transforming the earth into commodities, that flow is not a flow of interconnectedness. And in fact, it is leading to a disconnection. If you look at the violence that be being perpetrated, the reason I've written my new book, Making Peace with the Earth, is because I'm watching every day. I get calls every day from remote areas. Please come down, they're shooting us. They're trying to tear down our sacred mountain of Niamgari, which has bauxite for aluminium. We have an iron ore in our mountains. They're displacing us. Every day there's a land war. Every day there's a water war because of the appetite of this global commodity producing consumption based interconnection. And I often say that what we have is uh, interconnectedness of the world through greed, which is not how nature works, which is not how humanity works, and an exclusion of people, a killing of their humanity. It is not an accident that with the rise of corporate globalization and economic globalization, we have seen the rise of religious conflict, ethnic conflicts, where people get divided more and more and more. So we are seeing human divisions, you're seeing a deeper division between human beings and the earth, and all you see is a global reach. We are seeing a drop in our sense of a common humanity and definitely a collapse in the planetary consciousness that we need to have. And for me, those are the two elements of making peace with the earth, reclaiming our common humanity and reclaiming our recognition that we are earth citizens. The last time you were here, you were fighting Coca-Cola in India over the privatization of water. Now your bullseye is on Monsanto. Why is Monsanto so crucial to this fight over seeds? Monsanto is crucial to this fight because they are the biggest seed company now. Monsanto is privatizing the seed. They control 95% of the cotton in India, 90% of the soil in this country. They've taken over most of the seed companies of the world. You say it's all about seeds and that it comes down to corporations wanting to patent seeds. How does that work? What do you mean it comes down to seeds? Well, it comes down to seed for the simple reason everything begins as seed. The food on our plate, you and me were seed at one point. The little calf that becomes the cow. Seed is the source of life, and seed is the source of renewal of life. That is where life gets renewed in perpetuity. So what does it mean when a corporation patents a seed? The first thing it means is a lie, that I have created it. I have created life. Ah, the corporation. The corporations claim that, and you know, we joke and say, a GMO, a genetically modified organism, which was the path to get patenting on seeds. I've, I sat with, at meetings even where the corporation said, the reason we've got to do genetically modified organisms is because the only way we can claim a patent. A patent is a claim to invention, a claim to creation. 
and it brings with it an exclusive right to exclude anyone else from using, having, distributing the patented product.